evening all. Well, the big story this week, if you were living in the United Kingdom, was the Extinction Rebellion protests in London. Uh, essentially, um, what happened is a, a bunch of people, the Prime Minister called Crusties, uh, gathered uh, at various points in London to block bridges, impede people getting to work, impede people getting to hospital, causing a general nuisance, and all through the medium of improvisational jazz dance and theatre workshop. Um, for me, this catapulted me back to my childhood in the 1970s. I grew up in uh, northwest London, West Hampstead to be exact, and that kind of crap was happen happening every weekend. My mum would drag me along to some God awful festival in in uh, down Frognall saying, oh, it'd be fun, there'll be arts and crafts, and it was full of people, like the people you've seen, like, like that guy in the dreadlocks doing all this without his shirt on in front of the police. Ah, uh, every week, you know, it was like being in a Hawkwing concept album. So, what did this accomplish? You know, did it did it put things um, front and centre in people's minds? Well, the only thing that was put front and centre in people's minds was just how awful and rubbish and ludicrous Extinction Rebellion protesters are. People once again said, you know, this whole thing. Look, OK, climate change, let's talk about it, but let's not do this em embarrassing, cringeworthy performance art. Come on, go back to a theatre workshop. Go back, you know, so, sort of, don't put Brecht on Lambeth Bridge, for Christ's sake. Anyway, that was basically the reaction uh, went badly. Even people who are quite environmentally aware and concerned got on question time to just tell Extinction Rebellion, you're embarrassing. It's just embarrassing, it's just getting in everybody's way, and you're not helping. And one of the weirdest things that happened with this um, Extinction Rebellion protest, you know, um, hot on from their triumph last week of um, not being able to operate a fire hose properly, was that um, a group of protests, Extinction Rebellion protests, had glued themselves um, to New Broadcasting House for the BBC. And you wonder why, because the BBC had given lavish and extensive coverage to Extinction Rebellion, had Extinction Rebellion spokespeople uh, on the shows, questioned by Andrew Neil, Andrew Marr, on question time, uh, no less. So they had exposure, but no, 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 they were going to impede people coming in and going out of the BBC. The very hand that was feeding them, they were prepared to bite. Um, this is all narcissism. There is just absolutely no sincerity about any of this. I mean, all that kind of, let's do, let's do all this mime. Let's do all this mime, but only we understand. And heck, you know, I've been in, in the film and TV industry. I've sat in on enough drama workshops. Hello, cat. Uh, <laughs> she's such a, such a scene stealer, that one. But anyway, you know what I think it is? Alexa, fart. Alexa, stop. Anyway, let's move on to Brexit. Now, one of the weird things I've observed recently is uh, following on from Lady Hale's kind of creepy ass large spider brooch that she wore when um, delivering her verdict on the prorogation of Parliament. That a lot of FBP types not content with just having a string of EU flags and FBPE after their Twitter handles, have now started putting an emoji of a scary ass spider on them. And just thinking about it, you know, um, spiders, or whether you think they're, they're great around the house at uh, catching small insects, uh, one of God's creatures and all that, they, they are generally associated with um, Halloween, the night, spookiness, scariness. Um, their image is quite negative, even, you know, our little friendly huntsman spiders in this country are nothing compared to the kind of toxic monstrosities that you find elsewhere in the world. And it just seems to me that, you know, why would you put this spider badge next to your name if you're FBPE? Unless you were the baddies. There's all kinds of nonsense going on on social media about this. I mean, as we speak, We've got uh, negotiations going on between Boris Johnson and Leo Varadkar, um, uh, where they're hammering out deals as we speak. Um, 
And I don't know what's going to happen with them. There's numerous possibilities and scenarios there. Uh, so I'm not going to delve into that. Um, but I'm, I want to talk about the, um, the nature of the discourse about Brexit now. I mean, it's been pretty nasty for some time, but I think this week uh, has seen the, the most amount of hatred, bile um, and venom uh, over Brexit on social media. And I would say that the majority of it is from remain towards leave. Although I've noticed that some people on um, uh, on Twitter, um, my favourite uh, Brexit account is called Invisible Brexiteer. Um, he's a lawyer, or no, he's the gardener of a lawyer who uh, specialises in uh, European Union matters. And he argues uh, very vociferously to uh, leave the European Union. He has a lot of um, information, a lot of insider knowledge uh, that he shares. It's a great account to follow. And the amount of nonsense he gets from FBPE, he has now pretty much declared war on them. Um, just will instantly block them, uh, instantly calls out people who are diehard Remainers, you know, and he challenges them on um, what do they understand or know about the European Union. But even he, who at some point was kind of tongue in cheek, you know, he was very good on the facts, but he had a tongue in cheek uh, aspect to him. He's now gone a bit darker. And other people who have um, social media accounts who used to be kind of fairly uh, robust in their defense of uh, leaving the European Union, but not filled with anger and hatred towards Remainers, are now being pushed in that area. And I would say they have been pushed. They've had three years of constant slander and insult, and smears and lies thrown at them, that now they're kind of going, okay, that's it, I've had enough, I'm going to fight back, I'm going to push back. If they, if there is no clemency for me, there can be no clemency for them. And I, this, this saddens me that we've got to this stage. I mean, I, do, I don't want to have war with just under half of my fellow countrymen, but I feel that's where we've been pushed. And I feel the blame largely is on the Remain side. They could have offered an olive branch. I've said this on the biscuit many times before. They lost an election. They, um, a lot of the country is disillusioned with the European Union. They never ask the question, why are people being uh, have become disillusioned with the European Union? And if we could convince people to change their mind, what could we offer them? You know, I keep saying to Remainers, you've got to cut a deal. You want to you want to stay in the European Union. You've got 17.4 million people. You've got to win over. You've got to say, OK, 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 if, if you agree to change your mind, we will give you this in return. But they give nothing. No, no, we're supposed to take the insults. We're supposed to take the uh, the bile and the vitriol thrown at us. And then we're supposed to go groveling, going, oh, please, please, we're so sorry. We're so sorry we repent of our ways. The the solution that Remain could have floated towards Leave voters was that if you agree to remain in the European Union, we promise, we promise no euro as the UK currency, no joining the European army, that what's we have as a sovereign nation we hold. They never made that offer because they don't want to make that offer. And he said, uh, we are now at this impasse. And I lay this, I'd say 90% at uh, Remain's feet for the poisonous discourse. I mean, there are some right blowhards on the uh, leave side, but they're nowhere near as bad, nowhere near. Um, the, the the bile and hatred is just absolutely terrible. And I speak as someone who I try and go in there and I try and be droll and sarcastic uh, because that's kind of, you know, what I do um, as a brand. But even I'm getting weary. Even I'm being pushed to anger sometimes, you know, to let the, you know, some people say, let the anger flow, let the dark side flow. But you know, you can be pushed there. That's something Star Wars uh, saga never addressed was that could you go to the dark side because because the light side pushed you there?
you know, that'd be an interesting, you know, if they're going to do another sequel film, they should, they should investigate that. So the issue of voter identification has now reared its head. Um, this is legislation that's being proposed um, by the government, uh, which will be in the Queen's speech. And um, very predictably, David Lammy and Jess Phillips have um, decried it. Saying it's, going to, it's racist. Um, of course, they'd say that. Uh, it's going to hit poor people the hardest. Now, having I've just had a brief look at the uh, proposal, but it seems like you can take a passport. If you have a passport, you can show the passport um, as proof of identification. Uh, Passport costs eighty pounds uh, when you first apply, and I think if you reapply, it's cheaper. Um, but the government has said, you know, if you want voter identification, we will provide it to you for free. We're not going to price people out of voting. Um, so Lammy's and um, Phillips's uh, objections of um, largely, or their claims have been largely debunked. But it's interesting. Why, why would we want voter ID? Why are we worried about voter fraud? Well, one of the big reasons was the introduction of the postal ballot by the Labour government under Tony Blair. Yes, another winning policy from Tony Blair. And uh, there's been a lot of accusations. There's even been a conviction over voter fraud. Uh, you look at um, certain constituencies like Tower Hamlets and also um, when postal voting was first introduced, the Labour MP Keith Vaz came under suspicion for perhaps rigging it. And so it's an issue that keeps coming back and it mostly affects Labour constituencies uh, rather than constituencies of any other party. And it usually centres around postal votes, which are the if you're going to rig ballots, that's the easiest way of doing it. So it makes sense. You know, this was a, a labor created problem and it needs a solution. And lo and behold, uh, labor don't like it because um, it uh, it affects certain of their constituencies where they have been accused of meddling in uh, elections. So um, the argument is put forward by people in favour of it, that you have to have uh, a licence or identification, many other things. Uh, sometimes you might be asked for proof of identification when buying alcohol. Certainly you need it for driving a car. Um, and uh, short of um, a uh, full on biometric uh, citizen's identity card, another Labour idea from Tony Blair, which was uh, roundly defeated. This seems to be a, um, a practical measure to deal with a problem that Labour created. So um, it's not going to affect, despite Jess Phillips's claim, it's not going to affect the poorest in the community because they will be able to apply for a voter ID uh, card. Um, who it's going to affect are those people um, who were not born in this country, who spent a long time living outside this country, perhaps come from a country that doesn't have a democratic tradition because other countries have forms of voter identification. It's the kind, the very kind of voter that the Labour Party um, like to manipulate and like to gerrymander. So, you know, um, frankly, Labour, you know, it's the world's smallest violin and it's playing just for you. Alexa, what biscuits should I eat? Hmm, I don't know that one. Oh, well, I'm going to have to settle for a good old hobnob. Alexa, say good night. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs>